When the underground cyberpunk films began to fade out of fashion, it seemed the next wave of young aspiring Japanese filmmakers wanted to try something else with the formula, and they did. Hi my name's Rob and welcome to the channel where we explore the wonders of East Asian cinema today. Splatterpunk. What is splatterpunk cinema? Well, just like the cyberpunk movement, with films like Tetsuo and Rubber Zorva, it's not easy to define this movement. It's pretty open to interpretation as to what classifies as what. But if I was to state anything, I would say that it was a genre of lower budget core films from the early to late 2000s that were categorised by over the top scenarios, self awareness, and buckets of gore. They took the visual approach of many of the 90s filmmakers directors like Sukamoto, but applied it to insane horror and science fiction plots instead. Often the films have a female protagonist and centre around some sort of body transformation. You will often see some sort of erotic grotesque art that seems to evoke the Eroguro tradition, an artistic movement that is defined by nonsensical erotic gore. But splatterpunk is not to be confused with the splatter genre. The splatter genre had already been around for a while and was clearly a product of the 80s. Splatterpunk is something different in my opinion. So to understand this genre, let's go back to where it begins. And we need to go back to the 80s. Independent Japanese cinema in the 80s was very similar to Western cinema in that the horror films were really pushing the limits for what was acceptable. As a result, you get a string of what are now known as splatter films. Films such as the guinea pig series, Cyclops, Biotherapy and more. These films take the horror genre but make it all about the gore. They're sensationalist and exploitative as a means to get noticed, and it works. The plot isn't important here, it's about being provocative with taboo themes, buckets of gore and horrific scenario. These films stand up to some degree for a representation of a reactionary mode to that era of filmmaking and the growing saturated video market, but they're crude and lacking in terms of plot and other narrative devices. They were basically low budget filmmakers doing anything to get noticed. Bad publicity was good publicity and the guinea pig franchise is a prime example of that. If you want to find out more about the guinea pig franchise, then I did a video exploring just that, so I'll leave the link to it below. Anyway, on the flip side to this movement, you had a huge movement in underground countercultural filmmaking in the 80s, where punk filmmakers wanted to create science fiction films to reflect the growing tech era of the 80s. But these filmmakers had little to no money to pull this walk off, so they had to become inventive with their plots, effects, editing and cinematography to do it. And as a result you get the underground cyberpunk films, films like Death Powder, Tetsuo and 964 Pinocchio. These films were there as a reaction to the integration of tech in Japan and the rising pressures of this on young people. As a result you often see the human body being overtaken by technology in some way. But it isn't about gore, it's more about psychological trauma and chaos being depicted through a cinematic language, which leads to them really creating a distinct visual style, something the splatter films didn't have. They were a little less sophisticated with their cinematography and editing, but the essential energy of the two genres was the same. As the 90s approaches, these trends somewhat die out mainly because most of these underground filmmakers are now somewhat established or just haven't made it any further in their career. And as a result, their styles change. Sukamoto and Ishii notably step away from the punk style of underground filmmaking and others just fade away or evolve their style into something else. Therefore, a gap appears for new filmmakers to fill that void of independent cinema and it is here where you find the beginning of these splatterpunk films. There are some key films that emerge in this era that really help create the splatterpunk genre. The first one is actually from the end of the 80s, a film called Battle Heater. Released at the same time as Tetsuo, Battle Heater feels part of the cyberpunk movement, but it also doesn't feel at home in that grouping either. Interestingly, George Ouida, the director, starts by making a splatter film named Cyclops, and Battle Heater feels an extension of that style, but with added punk aesthetics and a touch of the growing cyberpunk trend. For that reason, it feels like a clear step towards the splatterpunk genre, but it also feels like its own thing. 
It has a bigger budget than most of the Cyberpunk films and Splatter films, so it doesn't have that DIY quality. Instead, it's a moderately budgeted horror comedy, but it has flares of these independent styles. Then we move into the 90s, we really begin to see what I'm going to call the proto splatterpunk films here, films that are transitional pieces towards the genre. The first is Anatomy or Extinction by Nishimura, who would go on to be arguably the most important director of the genre. This short 50 minute film is the foundation for what would become Tokyo Gore Police, but in this early incarnation, it resembles the cyberpunk genre a lot. In many ways, Anatomy or Extinction feels like kind of a rip off of Tetsuo the Iron Man. It uses a lot of the same visual techniques. It has a protagonist salary man just like Tetsuo that becomes infected in a subway, again, just like Tetsuo, and he slowly becomes a disfigured creature, again, like Tetsuo. However, it does one fundamental difference that kind of sets it apart from the cyberpunk genre. Instead of the transformation being one of man and machine, like most of those films, it's a biological body horror transformation that evokes Videodrome or The Thing. And this is something that becomes a staple of the splatterpunk genre, something the cyberpunk films don't really do. Thematically, Nishimura's film also deals with different social anxieties than Sukamoto's film. As Anatomia is more focused on the fear of overpopulation as opposed to the fear of the growing tech industry in Japan. However, the visuals are a direct result of the cyberpunk style, so you really see a transition within this film. It has different themes, but its presentation is the same as many of the cyberpunk films. Another film that does something similar around this time is Yamamoto's Meatball Machine in 1999, which gets remade in 2005 as a feature length film and a defining example of the genre. But the original short again is more of a proto splatterpunk film, as it resembles the cyberpunk style but offers a transition into a more bio horror style of gore. These two films essentially take the splatter genre and the cyberpunk genre of the 80s and combine them. They have more underground edge and countercultural sentimentalities than the splatter films, but they have more of a body horror edge than the cyberpunk films. They ultimately are the child of young filmmakers that clearly grew up admiring both of these previous genres, and as a result, you get these proto splatterpunk films. So then, when we go into the 2000s, here the genre really takes form. It evolves from those proto works into what we would now call Splatterpunk films. One of the first films that really feels like a Splatterpunk film is Versus. Here all the pieces come together. It's super over the top, it's gory with a punk sensibility, it's self aware and it has a visual style that feels like it's related to those earlier cyberpunk filmmakers. It stars Tak who would go on to be an important player in the genre, he would star in many of the films and he would also direct some of the Splatterpunk films as well. But Versus really sets the blueprint for what the genre in many ways becomes. Then Yamaguchi begins to really make an impact on the genre. He co-directs the remake of Meatball Machine, and his Battlefield Baseball series really defines some early styles for the genre. He also works on Yakuza Weaponry with Tak, who we previously mentioned. This is a common thing in the genre. Lots of the directors often work together or take over each other's projects, as though they're all working together on one body of work instead of working individually. You will often see co-directing credits from reoccurring pools of directors. For example, the feature for Meatball Machine is made by Yamamoto, the director of the original short, Yamaguchi, who we just mentioned, and Nishimura, who we will speak about in a moment, but he also directed the previously mentioned Anatomy or Extinction. These three directors are all key players for the genre, and many of the films they work on have become prime examples of the genre as well. Meatball Machine, whilst lacking in some respects, really exemplifies many of the key styles. It has crazy action, buckets of gore, body transformations, and punk sensibilities. It's clearly quite self-aware and over the top, but it has a defined plot and narrative. Overall, it's a very important film for the genre as it sees three of the key players all working together on it in the early days of this genre. Another important factor is that Nishimura does the special effects for Meatball Machine, 
and he actually works on the monster designs for many of the key directors during this period, as well as directing his own films. Therefore, Nishimura is actually one of the key architects of this entire genre. Many of the craziest images you'll see in this genre are all because of him in some way. His special effects create the very visual style of what Splatterpunk is. Right from the start with Anatomy or Extinction, Nishimura creates the image of this bio-enhanced human that would reoccur in many of the Splatterpunk films. The salary man in Anatomy or Extinction is almost the archetype for many of the monsters you see reoccurring in this genre. Furthermore, his film Tokyo Gore Police really exemplifies the best of the genre. It's postmodern, self-aware, gory, crazy, fun, and it's full of a punk countercultural spirit that reflects many of those filmmakers that came before it. Here you see a strong female lead, which is often the case in many spider punk films, and you see a plot that revolves around body transformation. His monster designs here are perfect and some of the best you will see in the genre. Nishimura directs many of the genre's best, from Hell Driver to the Meatball Machine sequel, to Vampire Girl vs Frankenstein Girl, to Mutant Girl Squad. Interestingly, Mutant Girl Squad is also a film directed by many of the key directors. You have Nishimura, Tak, and Iguchi. Iguchi is the final key director I'd like to mention in this. He directs arguably the second most iconic film after Tokyo Gore Police, that being The Machine Girl. Again here you see all the key components of the genre, body transformations, female weeds, crazy action and buckets of gore, but with a postmodern punk edge. It's classic splatterpunk at its best. As the 2010s close, the genre begins to fall out of fashion. The output of many of the directors slows down, and whilst people like Nishimura do still create films that I would call splatterpunk, they seem less inspired than they once were, and audiences don't seem as interested anymore. It feels like the height of this genre was a reaction to the oversaturated media market, the answer to a desensitised audience, and a self-aware spin on the previous J-horror movement, and they also felt like a delve into the emerging nostalgia craze as many of the films seem to evoke a sense of classic exploitation. In many ways, it's the evolution to a generation of filmmakers that have grew up in the video era, where content is readily available and as a result they create films where everything is ramped up to 10. These aren't films for everyone, but if you have ever enjoyed horror, action or cyberpunk films, then you will really enjoy the world of Japanese splatterpunk films. Thank you for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. I didn't go as in depth as I probably would have liked to, but it's such an expansive genre that I could have been here forever. So I'm definitely going to do more videos on the Spotterpunk films and look into maybe specific directors and specific titles and how they kind of operate within that world of cinema and really just delve into it probably over the next few uh, months or so. Um, so yeah, so if you enjoyed this video and you want to find out more about Spotterpunk films, then definitely like, comment and subscribe, let me know and um, stick around to see the next videos that we create with them. If you like what I do here then follow me on all uh, other social medias and stuff, all the links are down below in the description and I'll see you guys next time.